and thanks for watching. Today's video is a little bit different. Today's video is about hope and encouragement. It explains what drives me each and every day. My love for God and my love for people. See, 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with esophageal cancer and given just a very short time to live. And to give you a little backstory on that, 10 years ago, I owned a construction company. I was also a bivocational uh, Southern Baptist pastor. Sandy and I had just celebrated our 19th wedding anniversary. Sandy was a nurse in the home health field, and she's still a nurse today in the home health field. Our kids were 17, 15, and 13 then. The two oldest are boys, and our baby is a little girl. So I hope that you find encouragement and hope in this video. So previously, I had five and ten years before, I had experienced food getting stuck in my throat. It was no big deal. I was experiencing it again. But the previous two times, I went and had an endoscopy done. They ran a camera down my throat. They took this tool. They stretched my esophagus where it constricted, opened it back up. No big deal. Five years. It worked for five years. Food flowed up, flowed just like it was supposed to. This year on Monday, uh, on 2010, November 8th, it was a Monday morning. Sandy took me down to get an endoscopy done. They ran a camera down, all intentions of stretching my esophagus again. When I came to, I, they got me dressed. They kept me on the side of the bed. They wanted to talk to us for a minute. Sandy was sitting in a chair just across the bed from me. I was still sitting on the bed right there in the recovery room. Opened the curtain and there was uh, the doctor and wasn't a nurse this time. Doctor came in and said he wanted to talk to us for just a minute. He said he wasn't able to stretch the esophagus this time, that there was a tumor. He said he had taken 40 biopsies from up and down my esophagus. Yes, four, zero. 40 biopsies. He said what he wanted to do, he felt like it was, he was pretty sure it was cancer, but he, to be 100% certain, he needed to send it off um, for testing. He set me up for a PET scan on Wednesday, November the 10th. Um, so Tuesday I went home and took it easy. Wednesday morning, Sandy got up, went to work like normal. I got up, instead of going straight to work, I went and got an endoscopy done. I mean, went and had the PET scan done. Um, after the PET scan, I went and uh, went back and went to work just like normal, worked all day. We were hoping to get the results of the test of those boxes on Wednesday afternoon, but we didn't. So Thursday morning, I get up, I go to work, Sandy gets up, she goes to work. 2.30 in the afternoon on November the 11th, I go to the band town to go visit a friend. As I'm pulling into the parking lot, my phone rings. I answer it. It's Sandy. She said, hey, where are you? I said, I just pulled in to the rehab hospital over here to go see um, go see somebody. And she said, well, just stay right there in the parking lot. I'm across the street. But I just dropped labs off here at the hospital. I'll be right there. I said, great. I pulled into, into, the, into a parking spot. I put my truck in park, rolled both windows down, was sitting there. Someone I knew came walking up. They began to talk to me. They were standing at the driver's side door. Sandy pulled in behind me. She parked. She walked up to the driver's the passenger side uh, door. Window was down. I was waiting for her to get in. And she just started, um, tears just started rolling down her cheeks. And she said, I need to talk to you. Can you come back here to my car? So a uh, friend kind of uh, excused, it, excused themselves. I got out of the truck. I walked back to Sandy's car. She looked up at me. I'll never forget. She said, it's cancer. So they just called. She starts crying and boo-booing and um, we're holding hands and I just wrapped my arms around her. She wrapped her arms around me and I looked down at her and we locked eyes and I said, it's going to be okay. She looked up at me and she said, I, I'm the one supposed to be telling you that, not the other way around. See, since Monday, Sandy had been researching esophageal cancer. What does esophageal cancer mean and all of this stuff? I, me? I couldn't even pronounce esophageal at the time, much less spell it. And I wouldn't know what I was looking at if I, if I didn't know how to spell it. But Sandy had been researching and she knew all the stuff that needed to be known about esophageal cancer. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, that's the worst thing anybody can do is when you're diagnosed with something is to get online and start looking. 
Because you find all of the negatives, all of the side effects, all of that stuff. There's very little positive things about a bad diagnosis. But that's what she had been looking up. It's Thursday afternoon. She had been looking this up since Monday morning. Every spare minute she had, she was researching. She said, we have to be at the oncology center at the hospital in the morning at 7.30. We talked a little bit about where we, how we were going to handle this moving forward. We went home that night and to let you know how we were had just moved in to the to church parsonage. And the church sat on a 16-acre uh, campus. Uh, on the right, front right was the baseball softball field. Uh, on the front left of the property was the parsonage. And at the back right corner, all the way at the very back, sat the church. So there was this huge field, and it basically just looked like a, a big field between the parsonage and the church. Um, and then there was a path that went from the parsonage over to the baseball field. It's right on the road. But anyway, <clears throat> Thursday night, Sandy and I, Went home. Um, we always ate dinner with our kids. We sat down at the dinner table. That was November, November the eleventh, twenty ten. And at a dinner table, a time of when there's laughter and life, and just a, a joyous time for us every evening, sharing life together. That Thursday night, it was a little bit different. I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever had to share any news with your children, but as a dad with a 17, 15, and 13 year old sitting across the table from you, you have to look them in the eyes and tell them their dad has cancer. It's the toughest thing I've ever done in my life, is to tell them. A lot of questions, a lot of unanswered questions. We told them we were going to the hospital the next morning to meet with an oncologist, and they were welcome to go with us, and they chose not to. They chose to go on to school um, and for us to fill them in over the weekend. Next morning, 7 o'clock, Sandy and I arrive at the hospital. We get out. We go into the hospital. They were doing some work, um, renovations to the hospital, so our medical oncology was on the second floor of an old hospital wing. We walk in, we, we go to the second floor, we begin to walk down the hall. They take us to this hard, cold, institutionalized hospital room that had been converted into a consultation room. We go in, we have a seat, we sit down right next to each other, we're holding hands, waiting on the doctor to come in, and in walks this very young medical oncologist. And he comes in and he begins to talk to us. He introduces himself. We introduce ourselves. And he said, do you know why you're here? We said, absolutely. He said, well, you've been, been diagnosed with esophageal cancer. He takes his laptop. He turns around and he shows us what's going on. We have lymph nodes lit up from top to bottom. There's this big tumor right there at the base of my esophagus and the top of my stomach right there at that juncture. There's this huge glowing yellow spot. I mean, it was brighter than my jacket right now. It looked like the sun on my liver. He said, all of these places that are lit up yellow, that's cancer. He said, what I want you to know is I'm going to exhaust all of my resources. And we're going to fight this together. But I can tell you right now that if you believe in a God, you need to start praying. He said, that's your only hope. How little did he know that we, I was a pastor. We didn't, we didn't fill him in on that part. Sandy and I just started boohooing and crying and he got up and he walked out of the room as we gave us a few minutes to begin to, to talk and to compose ourselves. After a few minutes, he came back in and he sat down and he began to tell us that where we were going from here. He said, we only did a PET scan from here to here. We've got to do a full body PET scan. It could have went to your brain. It could be in your bones. It could be in the base of your spine. It could have spread anywhere. We need to check in order to get a, a true diagnosis and where we're going from here as far as treatments. That's what we've got to do. We looked at him and said, from according to what you know right now, and then let's just say that it is, that it is held right here. What do you think? And he looked at us and he said, uh, just knowing what I know right now. Then and that's it. He said, you've got six months at best. 
and that's with treatment. He said, we think between now and Christmas, you'll probably hold or stay close to maintaining what you are now. He said, but right after the first of the year, you'll begin to go downhill rapidly. And he said, son, I'm telling you that things need to be in order. In six months at best. So we got up, we held hands, and we left. He had already set us up for another PET scan for the following Wednesday. As we left, Sandy went back to work. I went to work for just a little while, and then I began to make a phone call. I called a great friend of mine who was a community pastor at a big church where Sandy and I are members that we attended in between churches, when we were in between churches. <coughs> I told him what was going on. He was a cancer survivor. He talked with me. He prayed with me a little bit. I asked him to please keep it confidential, and he did. Then I called another friend. I don't know if you've got a friend like this or not, but I got one. And, and, and no matter how many times you call him, no matter what you need, if you call him, he's not answering the phone. He'll call you right back. You text him, he'll call you. But if you call him, he's not answering that phone. So you got to leave him a message. And this guy's name's David Little. I'll never forget. He's the director of missions at the local Baptist Association. So I called David Little. I told him what was going on. He, he called me back. He didn't answer, but he did call me back. I told him what I needed when he called and said, hey, I just need for you to pray. I also need for you to know that I'm going to resign from the church on Sunday that, um, and they're going to need some help navigating this as I exit and trying to find someone new. And then... Um, I just probably need a little somebody to lean on. And he said, not a problem. And David prayed with me. And asked him to keep it confidential because I didn't want anybody in the church to know. I wanted them to hear it from me. He said, not a problem. After I talked to David Little, I just kind of hung out at church a little bit. I prayed. I went to the sanctuary. I went to the altar and I prayed. I left there, went home. Um, we had little girls all over the place. My daughter had already had a, uh, had a birthday party uh, set up. And so there were just a lot of 12 and 13 year old little girls. They were having a spend the night party. So um, Saturday, so Friday night after they went to bed, I just couldn't sleep. And I decided I was gonna walk down to the church. It was 2.30 in the morning. Walk down to the church to pray. So I'm walking from the parsonage down to the church and I get halfway down through that field and I can no longer walk. I'm just heartbroken. And I'll never forget, in the middle of that field, at 2.30 in the morning, I fell to my knees. I didn't scream at God. I didn't ask him a ton of questions like, why me, what did I do wrong? Look, I didn't ask any of those questions. And I'm not saying that if you have a diagnosis, there's nothing wrong with asking some questions. Because we don't get answers a lot of times until we ask those questions. But I didn't. I didn't scream and yell at the top of my lungs. And sometimes that's okay to scream and yell at the top of your lungs. You just got to get that frustration out. But I didn't. What I did do was I looked up at God. I said, Lord, if you're ready for me to come home, I'm ready. I'm not going to ask you why, but what I am going to ask you is this. Lord, if you have enough mercy in you for my wife, I'd appreciate it if you leave me here. My wife is the love of my life. And she has faced way too many heartbreaks in her life for this to be another one. God, if you think it's best for her and for me to come on home now, but I sure would like to stay here and be the husband that my wife needs. And I just sat out there in the middle of that field looking up, waiting for an answer, waiting for some kind of sign that would say, 
I hear you. But I didn't. So I got up, I went on to the house, I crawled in the bed, and I don't think I slept a wink that night. Saturday night, we explained to our kids exactly what the doctor said and what was going on. We told them Sunday morning we were going to get up, go to Sunday school. When I got up to preach the message, at the end of that message, that I would ask everybody to remain seated, that we had some news we wanted to share. So that's what we did on Sunday morning. About two songs in, Sandy just got real emotional and she got up and she left the sanctuary, she went to the bathroom and then went over to went over to the pastor's study. That's where she sat with the door shut. So after the fourth song, just like in a regular Baptist church, I got up to preach. I got about a minute and a half into, into my message. I just broke down and tears started rolling. And everybody got extremely quiet. Not that they weren't already, but everything got really quiet. I looked at my kids, which sat right there on the from the pulpit looking out. They sat on the very front row, right on the left. That's where they sat every Sunday. That's where her and, and where, where Sandy and the kids sat every Sunday morning. I looked down at the kids and I said, Thank hey, you. Go get your mom. So they got up, they went and found Sandy. They brought her back into the sanctuary. They came in and the kids stood right here on my left. Sandy walked around and stood right here on my right. <coughs> and I began to tell them the diagnosis we had gotten that week. And at that moment, you could have heard a pin drop. Now, Southern Baptists, we, you know, we believe in prayer, we believe in miracles, but we're not the kind that name it and claim it and lay hands on it and, and all that sort of stuff. But that's just not who we are. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that by any means. Just the traditional Southern Baptist way, that's not it. We'll pray for you. We'll love on you. We'll do anything in the world for you. But name it and claim it and, and, and laying on of hands and, and just believing at that moment that it's gone is not what we do. But I want to tell you, there was this young man, he was a teenager, who sat halfway back on the left-hand side, and he didn't come to church every Sunday. This Sunday he was there, and he was all the way on the outside of the pew, right on the outside aisle on the left-hand side, and he got up. As that church was deathly quiet, and he began to pray, and pray out loud and boldly, and I'll never forget, he walked up, walked behind us, and he laid his right hand on Sandy, he laid his left hand on me, and began to pray. And one by one, that entire congregation began to come up, and they laid hands on us, and laid hands on us, and somehow two chairs just appeared out of nowhere. And I don't know how they got to us with everybody around us, but they did, and they sat Sandy and I down in those chairs. And the entire church, if they couldn't get to us, they laid hands on the people that were in front of them, and it was like a chain that got to us. And for a solid hour, that entire church prayed for us. Not just me, not for just healing, but peace and comfort and prayed for my kids and prayed for Sandy and prayed for everything. And at the end, they said, in Jesus' name, amen. Somebody started singing Amazing Grace. Out of nowhere, just Amazing Grace. And everybody came by and just began to hug us and tell us they loved us. And if we needed anything, to let them know. They grabbed us, they walked us out of the church singing Amazing Grace, and they came out of the church one by one. We went on home that Sunday. Monday went to work. Tuesday, I kind of hung around the house. Sandy went to work. Wednesday, I went and had my second PET scan. <laughs> went and had it done, went to work, went to work on Thursday. 7.15, Sandy and I are finding ourselves back in that same consultation room on the second floor of the hospital in the oncology department. And he, <clears throat> when we sit down, out of nowhere, in walks a completely different oncologist. One totally different. We didn't even know that the one we saw last week was on vacation this week. So we get a whole other one. And this one, she walks in and she's standing there in the doorway. She's kind of bouncing and she's smiling. And she says, you got to get up and come with me. Come with me. And she turns around and she walks out and takes off. And Shane just kind of stands up and looks down at me and says, well, come on. 
I guess we got to go with her. We walk out of the room. We walk to the left. We get down there to the nurse's station. And, and that doctor pulls up two huge monitors from the, compu the computer monitors. And she said, this is last week's PET scan. And this is this week's PET scan. And so we don't know exactly what we're looking at. She goes, this is last week's. It's your esophagus is lit up like a Christmas tree. We got this spot on your esophagus. We have this spot on your liver. And over here on the right, we got a few, th few of them that are gone at the top of your esophagus. We still have this tumor at your stomach and esophagus juncture. But the spot on your liver, we can barely see it, but it's disappeared. She goes, I can't explain it, but what this means is that you are free for treatment. Sandy looks at her and says, can we have a second opinion? Two weeks later, we find ourselves at MUSC in Charleston, South Carolina, and standing in the number six thoracic surgeon's office in the country, and her name's Dr. Carolyn Reed. Dr. Carolyn Reed looks and she goes, I have dedicated my entire life to surgery and thor thoracic surgery and cancer. And I'm telling you right now, I don't care what you believe and I don't care what you say. Cancer can hide. Sometimes it camouflages itself, but when it's there, it's there. You can't have cancer yesterday and it gone today without some type of treatment. She goes, the test we're gonna run on you today will prove that. And I said, well, I haven't. I said, well, I kind of believe a little bit different. She goes, I'm telling you, I don't care what you believe. That's not the case. We had an endoscopy, a colonoscopy. We had a PET scan, had a CT scan and x-rays. At five o'clock in the afternoon, that same day, we're sitting back in Dr. Carolyn Reed's office and she, going out, she said, I don't have all of the test results back. Do not leave Charleston until you hear from me. Sandy and I go and get something to eat because it's Tuesday. I haven't eaten since Sunday night because of all of the tests I had to have run. We're sitting in the restaurant, we're done eating, we're sitting there having conversation, looked at each other and said, I guess we better get a room because there's no way the doctor will call us this late at night. We sit there, 7.30, we're sitting in the restaurant, phone rings. She goes, this is Dr. Carolyn Reed at NUSC. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, the spot on your liver is not showing up. She said, we can see it. It's got a little bit of a, a, a go to it, but it's not something that is consistent. We would normally say it was consistent with cancer. She wrote down some long name of how she was going to describe this. She goes, that's not it, but I don't know anything else to write in the spot to cover it. She goes, you're free for treatment and surgery. We went back to see her two weeks after that. Laid out our entire treatment plan, our surgery date. Sent us back to Greenwood. And that's where we began to administer our treatments. For five weeks, five days in a row, I, from seven o'clock Monday morning till noon on Friday, I wore this fanny pack that had a pump, pump five FU chemo through my body 24 hours a day. I took a shower with it, I slept with it. No matter what I did, that bag was right there with me. Simultaneously, I did, I did radiation treatments on all four sides. I still got all of, of the little two dots here, 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 and on my back. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, took weekends off just like chemo. I got the radiation treatments. <clears throat> 28 radiation treatments. Five weeks of chemo. After all that was done, I was sick as a dog every day. Couldn't swallow. Didn't have the energy to hardly move. I couldn't, I couldn't hardly walk to my truck without nearly passing out. Took a few weeks off, got another PET scan. Everything is still there. Nothing's shrinking, nothing's going away, but praise the Lord, there wasn't any additional growth. We were extremely happy. I was supposed to have surgery in the middle of March. Something happened with Dr. Reed. I had to wait until the end of March to go get surgery. We get there on a Monday, they go ahead and check us in. They put us in a, in a hospital room, got us checked in, put all of our stuff there and told us we could leave to be back at five o'clock on Tuesday morning. Sandy and I go back to a condo. We get up at five o'clock. We get up, we get to the hospital at five o'clock, go straight to the hospital room, walk right in, get undressed, and do all that stuff to verify who you are. I'm sitting in there at six o'clock in when it's Dr. Reed and the whole team. Take me back to the OR. She said, this is gonna be about nine hour surgery. Takes me back 15 hours I was in surgery. We had complications quite a few of them. 
I don't know if you know what a full Ivor Lewis esophagectomy is, but they cut me from here to here. They cut me from at the top, back here, all the way around my shoulder blade and around to my side. They open you up, they break your number four rib, I think it is, kind of push it out of the way. They go in, deflate your right lung so they can stick their whole hand in there and do some work. They take all this stuff right here, they pull it out, lay it to the side, they cut your esophagus out. They took a third of my uh, stomach out and what was left of my stomach, they made a drop tube, sewed it together and that's exactly what it was, a drop tube. And they pulled it up and tied it to the top three inches on my esophagus. Everything below that was taken out. Sewed me back up, <clears throat> sent me to ICU. I was in ICU for a while. I think I was in there for a day. They sent me out of there and sent me back to my room. I was hooked up with so many fluids and that sort of stuff, but they wanted me to walk, 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 walk. So Sandy's making sure that I walk every 30 to 40 minutes. I'm walk, making one lap around the whole hall of that floor. <clears throat> Everything's going great. About four days after surgery, I come down with a high fever, right around 102, 103. Can't get it to break. I'm sick. I'm so weak, I can't get out of the bed. My fever won't break, regardless of the medication they give me. No matter what's going on, I can't get it out. Dr. Reed comes in and she said, Mr. Charles, and I called her Sunshine. <laughs> I said, Yes, Sunshine. She said, You're very sick. And we're extremely worried about you. And we've got to take you back to surgery. She goes, as soon as the ER opens, we're going to take you back there. It's going to be a few hours, but as soon as it opens, we're going to take you back there and you're going to surgery. To this day, I'm not exactly sure what all they did. That surgery lasted five hours. They took a pick line out. They took my port out. They took all sorts of stuff out. On the way in, right before we went into the ER, right before I went into the operating room, the OR, she looked at me and she said, Mr. Charles, you're very sick. We ran into a lot of complications in that first surgery. And she said, you're weak. She goes, I need for you to hold on. If you can get through this, it'll be all downhill from here. And I said, okay, sunshine, we got it. Like I said, that surgery went in there, lasted quite a few hours, put me in ICU for another day, sent me back out, put me in the room. My fever had broke. They was put some IVs in me. They were feeding me full of antibiotics, other medications that I needed. I'm still on a liquid. I'm still not able to eat or drink. Only fluids I'm getting is through an IV. <coughs> So things are rocking and rolling. They're doing pretty good. Seven days after that, I'm starting to feel sick, I'm running another fever. I was having a hard time breathing. What I want to tell you is that Sandy, every morning, Sandy was in my hospital room at 7 a.m. She stayed in that hospital room till 7 p.m. every night. They didn't have a bed. They didn't have a couch to pull out to a bed. In that room, the room was kind of small. They couldn't bring in another bed for her to stay in there, so she was staying in a condo that some great friends of mine that are set up for at no cost for, us, for her to stay in while I'm in the hospital. That was uh, Larry and Nancy Dozier, great friends. But anyway, that night I was so sick, I thought I was gonna die standing there in my gown and I looked at Sandy and I said, sweetie, will you please spend the night? But I'm really sick and I'm afraid that if you leave, I'm not going to make it till in the morning. She went back to the condo, got a change of clothes, she brought back up there. 2.30 in the morning, just is, I don't know what it is about 2.30, but 2.30 is just keeps coming back up over and over again. But I'll never forget 2.30 that morning. I'm standing there and I'm holding the side of the bed and I can't breathe. And I'm in so much pain and this sharp pain just keeps shooting through my body. 
And the nurse walks in. She said, Mr. Charles, you've got to get in the bed. You've got to get in the bed. I said, if I get in that bed, I'm going to die. <clears throat> and I'm extremely sick. And like I said, I can hardly breathe. And she sees and understands that I can barely breathe at that moment. So she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Mr. Charles, I need for you to at least sit on the side of the bed because you're fixing to fall over. And at that moment, I know this is going to gross some of you out, but at that moment, this pain came through my body so bad that I just lost control and I urinated all over myself, the gown, and all over the floor. She sat, got me to sit on the side of the bed. She went and got somebody who came in to start cleaning up. While she was gone to get somebody to help clean up, <clears throat> I get to the walker, I get to the bathroom, and I start taking a shower. And I still have on my Ted hose. I don't know if you've ever had Ted hose on or not, but they're hard to get on and off by themselves. But I'm sitting there in that shower, sick as a dog, can barely breathe. I got the walker with me and I'm getting soaking wet. And at this moment, Sandy's awake trying to figure out what's going on and all of this sort of stuff. And she comes in there, she makes sure that I'm clean. She puts a new gown on, drives me off, gets a new gown on, gets me to the bed. She looks at me and she goes, you didn't take your tear hose off? Only a nurse would think of that, right? You didn't take your tear hose off before you got in the shower? She didn't care how I was feeling. Was worried about these tear hose. And I said, I didn't think, I didn't know what to say. She couldn't get them off. They were so tight, she couldn't get them off. So she ended up taking a pair of scissors and cutting those tattoos off. And she said, if you ever do this again, you don't have to worry about cancer because I'll kill you. Huh. Well, about a few minutes later, the nurse came back in. And um, the nurse came back in with an x-ray machine and they propped me up against the wall. They, the x-ray team takes x-rays. They send it back downstairs. 4.30. 4.30 that morning, in walked the team. Three doctors, four nurses. And I guarantee you there was at least seven residents walked into that room. There's almost 15 people in that room. And I'll never forget the residents and the nurses came to me and told me to get in the bed and I'm arguing with them because I said, if I get back in that bed, I'm gonna die. Y'all don't understand, I can't breathe. And the head nurse, head surgeon, which wasn't Dr. Reed at the time, is a little bitty lady Great doctor, phenomenal doctor. She was like five foot five and 80 pounds, tiny thing. She went over to Sandy and Sandy's waking up because she doesn't understand exactly what all the commotion is. Walks over to Sandy and tells Sandy, I need for you to leave the, house, to leave the room now. Sandy said, let me change my clothes. And when she said that, that doctor reached down, the surgeon reached down and grabbed Sandy's clothes. And when Sandy stood up, she put them in her chest and Sandy grabbed them. And that surgeon said, you'll have, there's a bathroom on the first floor and that's where you will be changing clothes. I need for you to leave now. So to get under the elevator and get to the first floor, Sandy had to walk out of my hospital room take a left, I was in the seventh room, she had to take a left, go past six hospital rooms, went through a set of double doors that stayed closed all the time, that went to a, a kind of a, like a foyer. Then you had to take a left, you could go straight to another section of the hospital, but you could take a left, and then a right, and then the elevators were right there. And she had to get on that, I was on the sixth floor, she had to go all the way down to the first floor. While Sandy's on her way out of the hospital room, this surgeon looks at me and she goes, you've got to get in the bed now. I get in the bed, she tells me to roll over and I told her I couldn't and she said, either you roll over or I'm going to roll you over. And I said, yes, ma'am. And so I began to start to roll over and the whole team grabs the sheets and they start helping me roll over. And as soon as I get on my left side, they take these scissors and they cut my gown off. They don't even try to take it off, they cut it off. 
And as soon as it's off, there's this nurse with a bucket and a sponge and it's full of betadine and she's got her rubber gloves on and she is coating my side with betadine and everything else that kills germs. I don't know what all was in there, but that's what she was doing. And it was running all over me, all over the sheets. I think it got down on the floor. They were not being neat whatsoever. And as soon as she moved that bucket, the head surgeon grabs his scalpel and she just starts cutting. No anesthesia, no nothing. I'm talking this is instantaneously and she starts cutting these slits in my side and she cuts five of them and she takes these tubes and she starts running into these slits and jamming them down in my side and hitting my ribs and nerves and everything else and then talking this is excruciating pain later sandy said that she was on the third floor she had walked down that hall went through the foyer taken a left took a right got in the elevator and was at the third floor when she heard me scream she said at that moment it's when i really thought i would never see you alive again she said i heard you scream that far away after they got all those tubes in me and situated, I felt immediate relief. All of that fluid that had built up around my heart and around my lungs and even just inside my whole chest cavity was just pouring out. Somewhere around 6.30, Dr. Reed walks in. She says, Mr. Charles, I have cleared the OR. We are on our way to surgery. This time she walks right beside me and she's holding my hand as we're walking to the, as they're taking me to the operating room. And just before we go through the double doors, she stops them. And she looks at me and she said, Mr. Charles, I know I told you that last surgery that if you'd make it through that, it was all downhill. She said, you have no idea how sick you are. And I'm not so sure I'm going to be able to do anything to help you. But you've got to understand that this fight is all you. She said, I can do my part. She said, but you've got to do yours. I'll never forget, I looked up at her and I said, Sunshine, if you do your part, I'll do mine. And if you win, we win. But if you lose, we lose. From that moment on, I don't remember anything else until waking up in the ICU. That surgery went on for 12 hours, by the way. Sandy said that I was in surgery for 12 hours. I woke up at 10, right around 10 o'clock the next morning. I remember looking at the clock thinking it was 10 o'clock at night, but it's actually 10 o'clock the next morning. I had my feet tied to the bed, my hands tied to the bed. I had tubes running out of my nostrils. I had a tube running down my throat. I had a catheter. I believe if there was an office in my body, that there was a tube running out of it, out of my ears, out of, I mean, everywhere. ICU was so small that the machines that were monitoring my body and the IVs and everything were right there and that the nurse had to squeeze back. And I was in so much pain, it's hard to describe. And I don't know that I could describe it. But as that nurse walks by, he's a male nurse, he walks by, I'm able to grab, because my hands are tied to the bed, I'm able to grab his shirt and I start to tug on it like that. And he leans over and he said, Mr. Charles, I know that you're in pain. The night nurse failed to give you your pain medicine. And I can't give you any pain medicine until the doctor writes new orders. I've contacted him. He's on his way up to review your chart and to write you new, to write new orders so I can get you pain medicine. If you can just hang on just a couple of more minutes, I'll get you some relief. That moment, I began to look at a little spot on the wall at the ceiling and wall juncture just across the room from me. And as I began to focus on that spot, I was going, if I could just think of a Bible verse that I could recite and think over that would bring me some peace and some comfort, just something. And I couldn't think not of a single Bible verse. 
I can't even think of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I can't even think of that. So I said, okay, if I can just sing a song, what song? And I was going, and I know that I wanted to sing Amazing Grace, but I couldn't even think of the song. I couldn't think of the words. Everybody knows the first few words to Amazing Grace, right? I couldn't. And then all of a sudden, these words came to me. It said, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. They got me my pain medicine. They brought a little peace to me. They got some pain medicine. They got me some relief. I go back to my hospital room, spend a few more days there. 28 days and three surgeries later, they're releasing me from the hospital. All I can eat is one spoonful of mashed potatoes. That's it. One spoonful, a teaspoon at that of mashed potatoes. That's all I could eat. That's all I could swallow. And that's all my stomach would hold. My wife sat in that hospital every day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for 28 straight days and never left my side. That's a wife. That's the love of my life. That's dedication. That's commitment. She never left to drive four hours to see her three babies. Now, my parents kept my kids while we were there, and they brought them down to see us a couple of times over the course of that time. But my wife never left to go home to check on her babies. She stayed right by my side. After I got home, six weeks later, we began a whole other chemo regimen called Taxol, or uh, Carbotax. It was Carboplatin and Taxol was the combination. It was the cocktail that they gave me. I got it once a week for six weeks. And after that, I didn't ring the bell. I got to do all of that sort of stuff. And nine years later, because that took almost a year of treatments and surgery and all of that sort of stuff. A year later, nine years ago, this past September, and today, 10 years after my diagnosis, I'm standing here alive healthy. I still get checkups once a year and everything's just wonderful. I still can't eat a whole lot. About a half a cheeseburger and half a order of fries is about all I can eat at one time. But the Lord saw me through that. And in case you don't know, it's Psalms 4610 where God says, be still know that I am God. I had it been for my friends and my church who prayed for me. My wife, who's a godly wife, sat right beside me for 12 hours a day for 28 straight days and actually spent the night there with me that one night to make sure that I was taken care of. Boy, I never made it. But for all of you that are out there, who have some terrible diagnosis or you think you're at the end of your rope, and no matter what's going on, I want you to know that there's hope. There's hope. You don't have to believe what everybody else tells you. What I'm telling you, there's a chance and there's a hope. So don't ever give up. Place all your cares on the Lord Jesus and he'll take care of you.